is to move the welfare population in this country to below one million, uh, which is less than 10% of when we started in 1996. I think this is realistic. Um, I don't know how many of you know who Daniel Burnham is, but he's a big hero in Chicago because he designed the Lakeshore, and, and Chicago is known as one of the most beautiful architectural cities in the country, and Daniel Burnham is the father of all that. And what he said is, make no little plans, they have no magic to stir men's blood. Now, we should say women's blood, too, now, because since Burnham was around, a lot has changed for the better. But that's exciting to me, the idea of fewer than a million people in this country on welfare, the idea of El Paso County having nobody on welfare. And I'll tell you, I'm meeting with the civic leaders tomorrow, the head of, uh, for breakfast, the Department of Human Services and others that are kind of key players in all this. I met with them last year. Uh, I'd be interested to see how many of my uh, wonderful thoughts they have adopted and, and what, what needles still need to be stuck in which behinds. But look, we, we need to, to have them know that they've got people behind them that are, care about this and really think that that is a realistic goal. Um, if we have, uh, the social spending I had in El Paso County was about $500 million and about $120 million um, TANF, 5 million United Way. I don't know if those numbers are still good um, 12 months later. Uh, but the unemployment level in Colorado Springs and in Colorado is pretty decent. And the thing that I, you know, I, I tried, I think I've proven to you that there's plenty of money. But I also need to prove to you that there are plenty of jobs. Because you, the community of people that work in this area sometimes say, well, you know, it's really hard to get a job. But the unemployment level in this country has been low for a long time. It will never be zero, but it's been low. And think of this. There are 12 million immigrants in this country, undocumented immigrants. Most of them are working. I'm not going to get into that debate, although I have strong views. But without those immigrants, who would be working in these restaurants? Who would be making the beds up in that Marriott? Who would be picking the crops? On and on and on and on. There are jobs. Uh, you know, I was in the inner city of Miami talking with uh, the African American leadership there, and within blocks there are cranes and high-rise buildings going up, mostly Hispanic workers doing that work. So that's a whole other cultural issue as to why the people who are on welfare aren't more of them in those jobs, but. Just don't try to convince me that there aren't jobs around. Now, you can say, as some people say, that, well, they're not enough to support a family of four. Well, I'll come back to you and say, what was your first job? What was your first job? McDonald's. Okay. Mine was pumping gas. You don't get your first job if you haven't worked before, and most of the people in welfare have not worked before. As a job, it'll support a family of four. I don't think anybody in this room had their first job as a, as a you know, a, what they, some people euphemistically call a working wage. You have to learn the habits of showing up on time, of doing what your boss tells you, of, you know, staying on the job. So we can't be too fussy about what that first job is, but, um, you know, what we did at UPS, where I've been involved for many years, is we took 50 people at, at the beginning of all this, and this is talked about in my book, took 50 people whom we would not have hired normally because they were not high school or GED and they had no work history. What they did have is what we call the self-sufficiency coach. They had some support in their community, whether it was a church or whatever, so that there was some uh, support on the other end, and then a minor amount of mentoring that went on at UPS. Three years later, of those 50, 37 were still on the job. That was a lower turnover rate than uh, UPS experienced from people that they normally hired. So it's enlightened self-interest if this is done right. So <coughs> there are plenty of jobs. There are plenty of jobs. Now, what we did in Illinois and is we got rid of a lot of the fragmentation of the services. Uh, what you can see in your chart, 
I'll start through. Have you got, most of you got, I was told it'd be 50 people and there were about 80, so we're kind of short of these things and I need a few for tomorrow morning, but I'm confident that there'll be some left on the chairs or some that are, that I have inspired less than I would have liked, so. Uh, but anyway, has, has everybody got these, pretty much? You can share? All right. Um, let's turn to, to exhibit one. And there you can see Colorado, with the pathetic 68%, uh, 30,000, compared to the heroic 87% of Illinois. Um, you've got much better mountains, but you need to do a better job here. Um, you can see the U.S. total, uh, the 12.2 down to the 4.9. Now, let's turn to Exhibit 2. That was... When I started as chairman of the Governor's Task Force in Illinois, we had all the key people around the table. We had the um, head of uh, the Department of Public Aid, the head of the Department of Alcohol and Substance Abuse, somebody from the Governor's Office, we had some community leaders, we had all the players around the table, mental health. This is, and we drew a diagram of how somebody who had multiple needs, what we call in the business multiple barriers uh, to work, how they were getting services. And this literally was a chart, but the minute I, I was doing an interview with the press, and I showed him the chart, and he laughed. And it showed up, he took it back to his office, and he had a cartoonist, a guy named Mike Thompson, this is the Springfield Journal Register in Illinois, and they converted it into a Ruth Goldberg cartoon. But it, this is literally the way it was organized. Now, most states are still organized this way. Uh, one of the kind of litmus tests I used uh, in, in some work I'm doing with a think tank is, is the Department of Alcohol and Substance Abuse part of the Department of Human Services? Because 50% of the people that are on welfare have alcohol and substance abuse problems, and 25% of them have mental health issues. So if it's different departments, you're ending up with all kinds of problems in integration. So uh, that, that was the chart. And Colorado uh, can organize at the county level and overcome some of this. And the reason that it is so bad is largely a function of what the feds are doing. But uh, let me now refer you to Exhibit 3. Exhibit 3 shows what is going on at the community level in terms of funding. Okay? So down the left, Housing, foster care, employment, day, day care, daycare, health care, etc. Across the top are the various agencies that provide them. They have normally separate offices, uh, separate groups of providers that do it. And the amount of money going into this Grand Boulevard community, this chart was done by McKinsey and Company, who provided pro bono services, for a, a community that you can walk around a couple of hours, though not safely, 35,000 people. 25,000 in below the poverty line, $251 million a year going into that community, but all highly fragmented as shown by this matrix chart. Now when you go to exhibit four, you will see what the culprit is there. Um, Will Rogers, who has always been kind of one of my heroes, said, I don't make jokes, I just watch government and report the facts. <laughs> and you would think that this was des designed by someone who wanted to make absolutely sure that your 520 million, billion, excuse me, billion, didn't work. Because if you have this many committees, the House committees are in the top, and at the bottom, all of the Senate committees, and then that many departments um, that, that, they, that they go through, you can be sure that the money is used as ineffectively as possible.